thank you guys so much for coming. Um, we have Shiri today from CSH, um, not on the Southwest team, which is the folks we normally work with uh, through the Elevate program, but on the Mid-Atlantic team. Um, so a new face today, and she's going to talk a little bit about fair housing um, and uh, purpose-built supportive housing. Uh, but I will, we only have an hour, so I'll just go ahead and let you take it away, Shiri. Sure. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks so much for inviting me. And hi, everybody. It's good to meet you all. Um, yeah, my name is Shiri. I'm on the Mid-Atlantic team at CSH. So I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, we do work in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware. So um, I'll be bringing you some examples of, of how things work out in here um, in the Mid-Atlantic as we go. Um, but today we're going to talk about fair housing and kind of leasing and how all of that works in supportive housing. So um, I have a couple of I have a couple of slides just as like visuals to keep us keep us moving. So I'm gonna gonna bring that up. Um, there we go. Great. Um, so want to we're gonna get into just some basics, super basics on fair housing. Um, as a reminder, we'll talk about some common questions that come up, like prioritization, coordinated entry. And then we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into a conviction record screening because um, we've done a lot of work on that out in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, but I really want to, you know, make this useful for you. So please ask your questions. Stop me if you, if I if you have questions about stuff. If something that I haven't covered you want to talk about, um, we should have plenty of time for discussion. Um, use you know chat or unmute and call out kind of whatever. You're comfortable with um we can keep this super informal and just because i have slides up doesn't mean it's like a fancy presentation please feel free to jump in with questions that you have um actually let me make sure that i can see the chat organize my my windows here okay so as i said quick basic reminder of what fair housing is fair housing isn't just one law it's there's the fair housing act but there's also Americans with Disabilities Act, Civil Rights Act, uh, Violence Against Women Act, there's court precedent, there's HUD guidance and regulatory framework. So fair housing really is this whole ecosystem of laws and regulations and court precedent and lots of other things that all combine into this sort of fair housing framework. So in many ways that can make it kind of complicated, but the basics of it is, and, and that's why there are fair housing experts out there that do wonderful work to help answer your nitty gritty nuanced questions about, about fair housing. A lot of what we'll talk about today is more kind of general guidance, um, but we always encourage like, get your local fair housing experts engaged on any questions that you have that are more specific. But there's seven federally protected classes, and those seven classes are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes gender identity and sexual orientation, family status, and disability. And family status is not marital status. Family status is like, do you have children in your household or not? And these seven protected classes are important because fair housing generally is about like you can generally states you cannot discriminate against a member based on this protected class so you cannot discriminate against anyone in a protected class in lots of different housing activities so that's the sale of housing that's rental housing that's the building of housing or financing of housing kind of anything in the housing world and housing is pretty broad it includes long-term housing, short-term housing, shelter. So it's nursing homes or other assisted living facilities, sort of lots of different types of housing. And the basic underlying concept is you cannot discriminate against anyone in these protected classes in the admission to housing or in the, the um, re retention of housing. There's a lot more detail we could go into, but that's kind of the basics to, to remind us. So one of any any questions before I go on? I sure I just want to clarify. So age is not one of those classes. Right. Okay. Not in fair housing. It's a is there a separate act? What is it? The housing for older Americans or something? There's so yeah. So then there's like other. So I will say in some states and localities, age has been added. So so things are added in some states and localities. My understanding is that there aren't any added classes in Nevada that I'm aware of, no. um, but there are other laws that protect age discrimination. 
Yeah, good question. Okay, so common question we get. Often supportive housing has a priority population. And there's a question of like, does having a priority population in supportive housing violate fair housing? Because you're saying, you know, you're, you're specifying showing preference for a certain population. The answer to that question is not necessarily. So just on, on its surface, having a priority doesn't violate fair housing. So you might be, you know, as people who are connected to supportive housing, you probably serve people with specific vulnerabilities, or maybe you have a special subpopulation that you work with. Um, it does not necessarily mean that you're violating fair housing by serving that subpopulation. There are lots of, you know, federal and local fair housing laws. They, they don't prevent properties from providing a preference for certain subpopulations. However, you can't establish a preference that discriminates against a protected class. So what does that mean? You can't say we have a preference for women because it discriminates against men, or we have a preference for, um, we have a preference for uh, other protected classes, for people of a certain religion, right? Because that, that will discriminate against people with another religion. Those, those seem pretty obvious, right? However, sometimes it gets a little fuzzier. So a really common example that gets kind of confusing is people with disabilities. So often there is housing that provides a preference, often supportive housing has a preference for people who have disabilities. You can do that. But what you can't do is say, we preference people with a specific disability, because that could be discriminating against people with other disabilities. So that's where you have to be. That's why we talk about being disability neutral. So often with supportive housing, you, you can establish a preference for people with disabilities, but not for the specific. However, there's a caveat there. There's going to be a lot of caveats in this conversation. One of these caveats is if your funding mandates this. So for example, there's the HOPWA program, which is a, fund, a specific funding for housing and services for people with HIV AIDS. Because that funding mandates that specific uh, diagnosis, you can say your preference is for people with that specific diagnosis. Another common example, so in Virginia, we have the 811 program. A lot of places have the 811 program. It's a rental assistance program. In Virginia, it's limited to a specific population, people with serious mental illness or people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So in Virginia, if you have 811 funding, you can express a preference for that population because your funding mandates it. So general kind of rule around um, prioritization of people with disabilities, if you, you, can, you can have that preference if it's disability neutral or if your funding mandates for a specific disability. Is that making sense? A lot of this is gonna feel kind of like wonky and nuanced. Another example is, um, an, or another important distinction to make is a preference versus a, a requirement. So there are certain requirements in housing often. For example, affordability is often a requirement. Like if you have affordable housing, people who are living there can't have a certain income, right? A higher than a certain income because it's for affordable housing. That's that's allowed. Also income is not a protected class. So that's allowed. That's a requirement. People of a certain income level. A preference, again, is showing that you're, you're prioritizing people with a certain characteristic, which is different than a requirement, not so necessarily requiring it. So often you're work, you wanna be working with preferences rather than requirements, because that can, um, that's often more kind of understandable in the fair housing context. Que further questions there. We're going to get into coordinated entry a little bit more in a second. But on this kind of prioritization question, anyone have any? Um, yeah, this is Eric. Um, I was wondering, I, I guess I was under the impression that you could have a preference for populations that would benefit from the type of services that are being provided by a facility, mm -hmm. which is sort of a workaround to, you know, um, you're not discriminating against other disabled populations, but certain people with a certain disability would really benefit from the services being offered by this particular facility. Yeah. And is there a way of writing your tenant selection plan that would meet pass muster with fair housing that way? Yeah, 
Great question. Um, and that's where you're getting at what, what we might call proxy indicators. So things that are not tied to a specific disability or a specific diagnosis, but indicative of like general vulnerability or need. Um, and so that the way you kind of expressed it as like folks who would benefit from or would be sort of best served in supportive housing, that's not specifying a specific diagnosis, a specific condition. It can mean a lot of things. Um, and so that is a way to kind of ensure that your resources are, because what's the purpose of that, right? It's, it's, it's a prioritization of resources and ensuring that the limited resources are going to those who have the highest level of need or vulnerability. And so can, when you're framing it in that, in that way of need or vulnerability, rather than people with this specific diagnosis, then you are opening, leaving it open to lots of different people and not specifically excluding folks in this in a protected class, but you're still able to kind of prioritize based on what that need is. And actually the coordinated entry conversation might get in a little bit more detail into what um, you're what you're asking. But is that making sense kind of how I frame that? Yeah. No, thank, I mean we're we're I mean there yes, we we've been um, going back and forth with our attorneys on how you do that in a way that uh, passes muster. Yeah. I'm glad, yeah, glad you're working with attorneys on that. I think the kind of general advice is, is usually like not calling out specific diagnoses as like an automatic yes or no, because that's ultimately like, it's not appropriate for us to make assumptions that a person needs a certain level of services based on a diagnosis that they have, or based on a, a disability that they might have. But that disability could be indicative of needs that they have, right? Like it's, so it's, a, it feels like a um, kind of just petty wording, but it's important because it shows that we're, that we're treating people based on what their demonstrated or expressed need is not based on the diagnosis that they do or don't have. And that's an important difference, which actually a lot of this kind of coordinated entry stuff gets into. So let me let me say a bit about this, and then I would love Eric to hear from others if this is if if it's still making sense or if there's there's confusion because like there's often confusion about how coordinated entry, this system of kind of referring people, assessing people's vulnerability and referring them to an appropriate space, like there's confusion sometimes about how that fits in with fair housing. Um, like when supportive housing is getting referrals from coordinated entry, is that a violation of fair housing? We have get, we get that question a lot. And so again, the short answer is no, but that it's not a violation. But again, there's some complications that we, that we should discuss. The, the good news here is that HUD has done a lot of, has offered a lot of guidance on this about kind of establishing priorities, establishing coordinated entry criteria, um, and how it aligns with fair housing. I will um, put a couple of links in the chat to that. Let me grab them for you. Because they've actually written some really, I think, I think really helpful guidance. Um, here's one. And then another one here. And I think this one is actually super helpful. And then I'll explain what it is that these links are talking about. I just want to get them to you. Okay. So as you all probably are aware, the purpose of coordinated entry is to speed up the process that someone is rehoused, right? To, and, and it's to, you know, really take the burden of navigating a complicated system off of the person experiencing the trauma of homelessness and placing that burden instead on the agencies and organizations that are part of that system. So get people housed quickly, move them through the system quickly, and also kind of in doing that, uncover the inequities that might be involved in the system as a, as a whole and address those inequities. And so if you think about that purpose to house people quickly, to meet people's specific needs quickly, like that's all working in working to further fair housing, right? Because we're trying to address the inequities that are involved in the court, in, in the system, the housing and homelessness system. And so, as I said, HUD has offered some guidance on coordinated entry and the use of coordinated entry in housing. And they focused on four specific qualities of effective coordinated entry. And one of them is prioritization. So specifically prioritizing people with the greatest need. 
um, that in and of itself is like a key part of coordinated entry is, is using some sort of prioritization criteria. How to set up that prioritization criteria in a way that is equitable um, and furthers fair housing, not rather than violating fair housing. That's that's something that's there's been a lot of discussion around, which I'm going to get into in a second. But some of the other important pieces of effective coordinated entry and prioritization is is you know think being low barrier, operating under the housing first model. So basically, not screening people out because of any perceived barriers like drug or alcohol use. Uh, conviction record, employment, income, and then kind of lowering screening barriers, not just for coordinated entry, but for housing that comes out of coordinated entry, right? Um, being person-centered is also a critical, important part. It's kind of focused on participant choice, where a person wants to live, what kind of services a person wants. That kind of, again, is why we don't focus on the diagnosis. We focus on what the person's um, needs communicated needs are um, because they have choice in what level of services they want, what kind of services they want, where they want to live, things like that. And then fair and equal access is an, a key part of coordinated entry that everyone has to have access to the system because if that's the, the one, that's the centralized um, space where people are being you know, referred out to different housing programs, everyone needs to be able to access that centralized place. So coordinated entry processes is, is needs to be designed to be accessible language-wise, physically accessible in lots of different locations so people know how to access it, information readily available. And so if all of these things are working as they're as designed, then the coordinated entry process and, ref and referrals from the coordinated entry process um, will work to further fair housing. And that prioritization piece is the piece that I think gets most confusing. So let's spend a bit talking about it. So again, this question of does the coordinated entry mandate, so basically does using coordinated entry for supportive housing, so often supportive housing draws from coordinated entry, does using that partnership, is that in conflict with fair housing? That was a question that was specifically asked to HUD a couple of years ago. And their response, again, was not necessarily. So one key part of that of their response is that prioritization actually furthers fair housing because it's designed to use data, real data, to examine inequities, to examine levels of vulnerability, to examine disparities, and therefore to address them, which, you know, recognizes like a need for prioritization. Similar to what we were saying before, prioritization cannot be based on a, on, a, on a protected class. And that can't be the sole basis. It can be part of the equation, but it can't be the sole basis. So again, like you cannot prioritize because people have serious mental illness, unless your funding mandates it. You can't specify because people have a physical disability, again, unless your funding mandates it, because you would be discriminating against people in another protected class. Now, you may be thinking, as Eric mentioned, that a person's vulnerability or level of need is impacted by having a disability, so, so that these things are one and the same. And that might be true, and HUD recognizes that, but so like a, to some extent, a person's disability can impact their vulnerability or their level of need. So the prioritization process can consider uh, a disability, but it's not appropriate to assume a person has a particular need based solely on that disability. I'm hoping you're seeing some of the distinction there. So to use a disability as the only criteria is not okay. But to use the disability as part of a broader um, assessment of vulnerability or need is okay and is in fact encouraged because that's part of the prioritization process. So someone can't automatically be prioritized based on, on any specific diagnosis, but things like it can be part of the bigger picture. So things like frequency of hospitalizations is a good, and that's where I went into that, those proxy indicators I mentioned before. You're looking at other things that help tell the story that a, a, a specific diagnosis could be a part of. So frequency of hospitalizations or ER visits 
or difficulties that might limit the type of housing someone can access. So barriers to accessing certain housing, um, barriers to securing employment, services that might be, that are expressed to be needed. Like those are all different indicators that can be used in assessing someone's vulnerability level instead of just a diagnosis on its own. And this is true regardless of, of, what the protected class is, right? This is not just about disability, but I'm using that example because often that's where it gets the most kind of complicated and sticky for lack of a better word. So again, it's really important that you capture lots of information that it's not, that you don't assume that, that because someone has a specific diagnosis that their level of need is a specific amount. It's part of a larger picture. And that's how you can word your tenant selection plan to kind of talk about the bigger picture of vulnerability and not just specific diagnoses. Sure, you had a question. Yes. So if you had a property, like a, a say, let's say that you're the owner operator and could you simply set a preference for folks coming off of the community queue and say, and because, say because I count all of these things versus actually having to name all of the things? Absolutely, yes. Okay. And that's very common. And actually that's kind of a best practice in supportive housing is to utilize those other systems um, to kind of help your prioritization. Because again, those, those systems like coming off of the queue, that coordinated entry system, using the continuum of care, they have based their prioritization off of community level data, done a lot of work to establish those written and they're, and they're established in the written standards. They've gone through a review process from HUD, like they're well-established standards. So you partnering with them and using their referral process is a best practice. We see that a lot in um, all, really all the states we work, we work in. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions or thoughts here before we shift gears a little bit into tenant selection more broadly. Um, this is Eric again. I was yeah. just, I, I guess I'm interested in the intersection between this and um, purpose-built permanent supportive housing where you may have a provider that specializes in serving a certain population that can only support itself if it gets a certain amount of Medicaid reimbursement yeah. to do that in a critical mass or yeah. that you're intersecting with the housing authority where they have their own uh, tenant uh, preferences system that you're intersecting with, as well as a property manager that is also screening the tenant. So you basically have, you know, two or three levels of 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 screening before yeah. someone actually makes it into a unit. And you're trying to model something that will work in the long term for a provider that you know I really want to serve people with chronic mental illness, and that's what I that's what our company does for. I'm, I'm saying. I don't yeah. do this. I'm, I'm an yeah. on the finance side, but that we need a critical mass of people who, you know, who we can serve or else we can't, we can't make that permanent supportive housing model work. Yeah. That's a really, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And that's a really tough, it, it, it's a good reminder of the many, many different pieces that you're trying to fit together to make a supportive housing property happen. And I, it also brings up um, this important separation of how of the housing process and the services process and we know in supportive housing they're integrated but in but they're also separate in that one doesn't necessarily determine the other and so often we we actually see that pretty commonly where there's a service provider that serves people with serious mental illness and then the housing provider wants to only house people with serious mental illness. And that's, as, as we've discussed, like that's not, that's not gonna, not gonna swing unless the rental assistance, for example, that is associated with those units is earmarked specifically for people with serious mental illness. Like that's one way in which that might be okay. Um, but that's not, that can happen at the housing authority level say, we're gonna earmark these vouchers for this purpose. It, right. it would have there's, to be a, some local a, funds a funding a funding stream exactly. that is specific for that population. And exactly. Yeah. You you can't yeah. you can't artificially do it. Right. Right. It, it right. It sounds like um, it sounds like through a lot of communities, 
the service, the supportive housing providers go through the COC and coordinated entry system and they're accessing HUD funds, which earmark those funds for specific populations that are like targeting ending chronic homelessness or serving a certain population. So it sounds like to achieve that critical mass, we need more housing providers to participate in the COC process and access some of those HUD funds. And then we can have a more coordinated process. Right. I don't, and this is what it sounds like right. to me. Right, and in Nevada right now, there's almost no intersection between COC and the affordable housing world. I mean, there's none, as far as I'm aware, there's none. There is no, coordinated entry does not refer to, you know, our affordable housing community in, in Nevada, I don't think, I mean, perhaps I'm wrong. I think, I mean, I think not in the way other communities, there's not definitely not a robust. I mean, it's, housing. yeah. Right, I mean, and like, in we work in Houston, and so they're, They've had 15 years of project-based voucher RFPs, which are directly tied to their coordinated entry system. And so they now have an infrastructure of where the housing authority is basically saying, if you want our vouchers, you have to use coordinated entry. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to build that critical mass there, but mm -hmm. that way. Katrina? But we don't have anything like that here. Yeah, I just wanted to share that that's sort of explicitly what we're doing with our affordable housing trust fund and also explicitly what we're doing with our 50 unit building on the CARES campus. So is it currently in existence? No, are we rapidly approaching when it is gonna be in existence? Absolutely. This was also a really intentional choice on the, the use of that affordable housing trust fund and I see JD's on here and I'm thrilled. Anything you wanna add, JD, please jump in. But I just wanna say that it, I think it really right now is the perfect time for us in that tight and make that pivot in Nevada so that we are prioritizing these populations and that we are looking to these creative funding sources that we have available right now to make that pivot. Also looking at things like AB 310, I think we're in a really perfect environment to not kind of cling to like, well, this is how we've always done it or it's not possible. I think we have an amazing opportunity right now to really shift that and move in that direction so we can serve these high need populations and, and kind of abandon a lot of these like, oh, no, no, that's why we can't do it. Like, I just think we have an amazing opportunity in front of us to really think creatively and serve this population. Ditto, Katrina. Thank you so much. Sorry, Jamie, I didn't mean to interrupt. And if I could, Christy Costa with Northern Nevada Community Housing, uh, we do work directly with project-based vouchers at most all of our properties. So maybe not in direct um, correlation with the COC, but definitely in a, the um, housing authorities going off of the COC. So we get a lot of their project-based vouchers. Um, and, and me as a licensed social worker coming in to be the supportive side of the supportive housing, I'm at a lot of the COC meetings. I'm, I'm in the trenches with the people that are trying to house. So they definitely reach out to me directly. That's Sparks PD, Reno PD, all of the people in the trenches that are coming into contact with the people that are building um, the coordinated entry, as well as people that are placing off of that. So we kind of indirect, but yes, we do We do a lot of work with, with the coordinated entry stuff, placing people with the project-based vouchers. It's good to hear. Yeah, I would say that this is really like, you know, for if, if supportive housing properties are wanting to serve true supportive housing populations, like the best way to do that is to utilize the coordinated entry system or the COC. And because you have the house, like though they are encountering people who need supportive housing and you, and are looking for units and you have the units. And so that's like a, a really kind of clear partnership where the, the COC is doing the prioritization for you essentially. And you are, and you can, it, it's really like the most, the most streamlined process to kind of fill your units and fill turnover units and things like that. Correct. And your current, your current page on um, your PowerPoint um, really hits home for me because a lot of our people get waitlisted. And I think just knowing that there's a confusion that we are able to prioritize and kind of triage the people that come into contact with me. Um, I think this is something I, I take to my upper management and get um, permission to use this effectively versus putting, and, and I mean, there's, there's barriers in place when we're dealing with homeless populations 
where we can put them on a list today, but are we going to be able to get in touch with them even if it's a day later, two days? Yeah. Um, we are willing to put their case management or anybody representing them um, also. <clears throat> but sometimes when we when we get that application, we get that unit ready, they're nowhere to be found. Yeah. And we have to move on as property management. We can't just hold it vacant. And with the transient nature, sometimes we just can't track them down. So I think this, um, I've already screenshotted it. I, I will take this and I will I will go to the top to try to prioritize this. Will be huge in doing a triage as I, um, up until this point, I thought, you know, it's, you're violating fair housing by um, breaching the, the wait list. We, we try to stick to all of the guidelines with fair housing and um, this, this helps with that. This is very helpful. I'm glad to hear that. And Chrissy, I'd encourage you to take a look at that link I put in the chat. That's where this comes from. Um, there's like some more detail. It's a, it was actually a question that was submitted to HUD and then they answered it kind of in a lot of detail. So I'd encourage you to look at that too for some more. This is kind of a summary. I absolutely will. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to give a quick plug to before Sherry you move on is that um, I'm not an expert in funding and how these kind of funding streams work, but I know that the more units that you have online through coordinated entry, the more funding you can get from HUD because you're showing the need for more funding to, to access these units. So by not having as much of a coordinated response with our the units that are available in the same system, we actually leave money on the table uh, by not working together. And so I have a contract with CSH right now, actually, to do when uh, Brooke and her team are working on uh, doing a report for us to kind of show us what's possible if we coordinate our uh, affordable housing units with coordinated entry a little bit better. So hopefully we can continue that discussion in a more meaningful way about shifting systems. Yeah, that's great. Okay, if you have continued questions or comments, please continue to share them. Well, I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk about tenant selection. And I'd actually love to hear from you all. And I know that we might have folks in the room that aren't necessarily doing tenant selection themselves, but if you are, I'm wondering like what's involved in that process. Like when you're evaluating applications for your property, what are you looking for? what's involved what are you asking for curious kind of what's part of that tenant selection process or leasing up process if there are folks in the room who do that i'm not sure anyone I think folks are shy because there definitely okay. are people in the room who do that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering like, how do you, do folks do, do you do like a credit check? Do you do a rental history? Ask for rental history. Do you look at background screening? Do you ask for income? Probably we, a lot of those we, things. We do that at the housing authority. We have probably okay. a variety of, Screening depending on again the funding, right? We have public housing, we have some loan, we have LIHTC properties, we have other kinds of funding that we've developed. So each of depending on the situation, there might be some criteria, different criteria. But everything you just said are uh, things that we do take into account. Um, yeah. And I don't manage that directly. I just know that we're we we do that um, on the properties that we have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for uh, Northern Nevada Community Housing, we have a lot of varying situations. Some have um, homeless, uh, chronically homeless, veteran. We have a veteran preference. Yeah. Um, but definitely all of our properties are income-based. Um, we are bridging up, trying to hit that working class to the 60% AMI. We were finding that the 40% were not able to target people that were actually having some sort of um, income versus, you know, like your fixed social security or whatnot. Um, and then because we are light tech, we have, um, some strict guidelines on violent felonies or recent evictions, stuff like that. But we have, um, skirted that with the fact that if you bring in ongoing case management, you are now what we consider an SNP. Um, we are able to look past a lot of that stuff, including recent evictions, um, 
And we work with people that will pay off power bills if they need to get the power set at our property. Some of them are, it's, it's provided. Um, but yeah, the being able to be an SMP can skirt some of the tenant selection process a normal person just coming in from the street without that wouldn't be able to do. Um, but yeah, one of the big ones for us is the income, the income qualification. Yeah, super interesting that there's kind of a, a way to get around some of the requirements that are sent to you from like the funding. Sort yeah, of if it, the wraparound services are huge and we have, we have a couple big partners within the community We've got um, the VA that bring a lot of their veterans to all of our properties. And as long as they've got that ongoing case management piece, um, we can look past that stuff. And we we don't, because we're low income based, we do not look, we don't put a lot of weight on the um, credit report. So um, whereas a lot of other places be like credit score and you're, you're done. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Christy, you just really uh, beautifully described what a low barrier screening process looks like. So I, I mean, I, I have some kind of guidance for, for you all on what a screening process can and should look like for supportive housing, because ultimately like the purpose of tenant screening is to determine eligibility and to like ensure that a person is going to be able to fulfill the obligations of their lease, right? Like that's really all that needs to be involved, but often we add a lot of other stuff to it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those things. So a couple of things to just some principles and considerations to keep in mind um, as you're establishing tenant selection criteria, or if you're a service provider, like as you're looking at tenant selection criteria for folks um, you're working with, you know, often, ten, you know, there needs to be some sort of tenant selection process because like, Maybe you have affordability requirements and you need to make sure that people are within a certain income band or for some um, continuum of care programs, like meeting the definition of chronic homelessness is a criteria for permanent supportive housing. So you need to like make sure that there's eligibility for that program and eligibility and screening criteria can be a strategy that focuses allocation of limited resources for the most vulnerable population. So screening makes a lot of sense. But screening can also often have a discriminatory effect on people in a protected class and therefore like end up being a violation of fair housing and actually exclude people that you're trying to serve, that supportive housing is designed to serve. And so that example you just gave of credit checks is a great example. Often credit checks are used in housing for maybe understandable reasons. You could argue about that, but credit checks are used in housing often. But when you're trying to support a supportive housing population that almost always is going to have bad credit, you're going to end up excluding the very people you're trying to serve. So especially in all housing, I think we need to be more mindful of the selection criteria we're using, but especially in supportive housing. So a couple of principles to keep in mind is that you should be thinking about how to screen people in rather than screen them out. You know, many policies are used to look for reasons that folks should not be included, right? Like cutoffs to, to keep people out. But in supportive housing, we really we want to think about how we can screen people in. We want to we want to have the mindset that we want the person to come live in our property um, and really not set the bar too high. Our tenant selection process should be kind of designed to encourage tenancy have not a lot of hoops to jump through, really make it kind of as easy as possible for folks to be accepted, assuming that they are eligible from some of those really objective policies. And that brings us to the second one is that screening criteria should be purposeful and objective. So things like income, pretty objective, right? Things that are really directed or really um, specified and usually given by your funder. Don't put anything on there. If you can't answer the question, why am I asking for this? Or what am I looking for in this step of the process? And why am I looking for it? So really kind of, you know, if you, if you are a housing provider that has a tenant selection plan, I'd encourage you to go through that and think like, really ask that question with each step. Because each thing should be related directly to meeting the terms of the lease. I've seen some, we did a big review of tenant selection plans in Virginia. And we saw some things on there like, that were related to what a person is wearing when they come apply for a unit. Like that's not relevant to, can this person meet the terms of the lease? It shouldn't be part of the screening criteria. And yet it was in there, right? There are a couple of things like that, that um, 
that aren't related. And so we really want to be careful of kind of, is it directly related to someone being able to meet the terms of the lease? And if not, take it out. And then it's really important that your tenant selection plan is in writing and really clearly written in kind of accessible language so that anyone who has an interest in applying to your property can look at it um, and can understand exactly what kind of screening is going to be done. And it has to apply equally. So um, across across the board. Um, now, Christy mentioned that looking at people who have case management, um, there's they're going to waive certain things totally understand that. So that's, but that's kind of part of the like overall assessment of looking at each person as an individual that you are, maybe there are some, some concerns about someone meeting terms of the lease, but knowing that they have case management support and external supports around them, you might not be as concerned about that. So that's a way that you can kind of take all factors into consideration, still apply things equally to everybody, but recognize um, supports that certain folks have that might, that might be helpful in their um, success as a tenant. And then there should always be some sort of appeal process that's really clearly stated. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as you're putting together tenant selection plans or screening criteria. Um, any thoughts or questions on that? Sure, I'm struck by how this, you kind of have to be really on the ground to do this well. And I know sometimes when folks, they have a third party property manager they might have some service that does this, right? They're like, oh, we'll collect your information. We send it into this black box. And then yeah. for some reason you're denied. And like the, even the property management will be like, I don't know why you were denied. Just yeah. the, the thing that we, the the folks we paid to, to screen said you're denied. That doesn't sound like a best practice on supportive housing. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I would, I really, there. I will say there is some work being done on the federal level to have some more regulation over those screening companies. So that's, but I would say that's probably not, happening fast enough to really impact the people who are looking for housing now. So I, I, yeah, I would agree, JD. I think it's really important that you are paying close attention to what property managers are doing, paying close attention to what a screening company is doing. If you're working with a screening company, really like understand their process. Um, often, if you're working with a screening company, you still get to set the criteria that they're screening for. So what is review what that criteria what's included in that criteria and really think carefully about why it's included. We, yeah, we really good point. dealt with that directly here, um, probably about a year and a half, two years ago, we changed our management software and we did outside compliance. And Jocelyn Graham was really on point with this because all of the denials would come to us and we'd go to her like, why are they denying this? And it could have been something that was, you know, uh, income based or whatnot based off of the wrong calculations. And she's been doing this for almost 20 years. So it was ironic, but she switched it over because we're growing, not because she didn't know what she was doing. Yeah. And it was really helpful, like you said, to oversee what that outside criteria was actually going off of because they were yeah. wrong. So there were several that she had to reverse, like, nope, I'm accepting this. She'd initial it and we'd send it off and tenant would move in, but he's absolutely right. You've got a third party that's making the decisions and you're sitting there like, I'm not really sure why. So the oversight is huge. Yeah. Oh, wow. What a story. Yeah. Thanks for that. That happens a lot. One place where that happens a lot. And actually I want to spend the kind of the rest of our time talking about this. One place that happens a lot is in conviction record screening. So when you look at, you know, does someone have convictions on their record? Um, and whether that impacts their ability to come live in your housing or not. So conviction record screening is a super common part of uh, tenant selection. Um, and I wanna talk about that because it is a huge, huge barrier for a lot of supportive housing populations. And so I think it's really important that we get at some of the details of why we even do conviction record screening, why that's a part of our process and are there ways we can do that in a more equitable way, in a way that doesn't pose as big a barrier for a lot of people. Because again, supportive housing is designed to serve people who have high vulnerability and a lot of need. And very often, those are the same people that have some sort of conviction record, have some incarceration in their history. And so we got to think about how can we be 
serving the people that supportive housing is designed to serve. Um, and often that means kind of changing our conviction record policy. So I want to spend a bit of time talking about that real quick. Um, we often think that conviction record is just kind of a standard part of screening, but it's not actually true. Like we did some research on this. We've done a lot of work on this in Virginia and we did some research and learned that it's really only in the past like 20, 30 years that conviction record has become a, a kind of established part of the tenant screening process. And the rise of that kind of coincided with a lot of um, the sort of federal like war on drugs, um, kind of tough on crime legislation really trying to see people as, um, it re and really was like tied with a lot of rhetoric that kind of dehumanized a lot of, of folks and kind of saw people as beyond reform, this need to separate people who had been incarcerated from the rest of the community. A lot of kind of, um, I don't know, I think kind of some, some dangerous ideology that I don't think we really wanna be perpetuating, especially in supportive housing. Um, the, I looked it up and the incarceration rate in Nevada is higher than the U.S. average. And we already know that the U.S. average, U.S. incarceration rate is higher than many of our peer countries in the world. And so it's a pretty, the same is true of Virginia, also higher than the national average. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of people that are, that are impacted by incarceration. And so if we're presenting exclusions for in housing for people who have a history of incarceration, we're excluding a lot of people. Um, there's also high disparities in that population. Um, so, so in Nevada, about based on a couple of years ago, when I, for, for the research that I looked at earlier, um, in Nevada, about 9% of the population is black, but 30% of the prison population and 32% of the jail population is black. So really disproportionate rates. So when we're excluding folks who have some sort of conviction history on their record, we're disproportionately excluding black populations, which we know also have higher rates of homelessness. So again, we're excluding the very people that were that supportive housing is designed to serve. So we want us to like think a little bit about like how can we be reforming our criminal background screening policies in order to make sure that we're serving the people that we're designed to serve. And so I have some resources for you on that. I would say first off, just like the most equitable thing to do would be just not even look at conviction record at all. And you might be like, oh, but like we have to, that's like, we need our property to be safe. We need to like make sure that we have, you know, safety of our residents in mind. And I totally agree. Safety is super important, but there's actually no evidence connecting a person's conviction record with like bad performance as a tenant. In fact, we have data proving the opposite that there's no correlation between a conviction record and performance as a tenant. And when people are housed stably, they're much less likely to uh, commit crimes again in the future. So it's actually like in our best interest to ensure that we can provide housing opportunities to people who have some sort of conviction history. And so want to just encourage us to like shake out of our assumptions that we might be having about what it might look like to open the doors to people who have some sort of conviction history on their record. And as I said, we've kind of done a lot on this in, in Virginia. And one of the things we've put together is like a model screening policy, like a template that can be used to, um, as kind of a proposed alternative to a traditional criminal history screening. I'm gonna put a link to that. Um, oops, that's not the right one. That was a link I already shared. Hold on just a second. Um, it's designed to be a kind of template that you can use if you want to um, in your own process. Um, it can also be kind of a basis to work off of, but it's it kind of breaks it down into this three-part process where you're first looking at eligibility with like income, the kind of, if there's a special population that you need, um, and that's the first step. And then if a person is eligible, you would make them a conditional offer of acceptance. And it's only after that, that you do any kind of conviction record screening. We'd encourage you to limit the time. A lot of, a lot of places have a, a lifetime look back period, or they say any kind of conviction in any part of your history or a conviction dating back 10 years is gonna bar you from this property. We'd encourage you to not do that, to only look at felonies if you have to, only look less than three years or even shorter. 
And then we would encourage what's called an individualized assessment, which is where you look at the context, the timing, any kind of other relevant information that might help you understand better the context that someone is living in. We hear a lot of stories of someone who, you know, they were actively experiencing homelessness at the time of this conviction. And it was um, something that does not actually lead to any kind of concern or violent activity. In Virginia, a lot of um, the name of a conviction is super misleading. So like, something like stealing a candy bar from a grocery store or like stealing a loaf of bread from the grocery store is like breaking violent breaking and entering like there's really like distinct um or really big gaps in what a conviction is called versus what actually happened so when you're doing this individualized assessment it allows you to look at more nuance and some of the more context surrounding what a conviction is so we have this kind of proposed alternative to the traditional tenant screening that I encourage you to think about. We also, I also shared in the chat a, a list of frequently asked questions that we, um, nope, I didn't share that one yet. Let me share that now. Um, that is designed to kind of help answer a lot of the questions that might come up as you are considering changing your screening process or as you're advocating for a change in another property screening process. Um, while we were putting this process together and workshopping it with a lot of property management partners, we got a lot of questions that we then compiled into a document and tried to answer with a lot of data and research. And so it can answer questions you might have or it can equip you with, um, with data and with messaging to respond when other people have questions for you about lowering screening criteria. So one question that came up a ton was um, HUD requires, right? It sounds like we have some housing authority folks here. HUD requires certain level of background screening. But what we learned is that there's actually a lot of um, misconception about what is actually required by HUD. So what's on here on the screen is like, these are the things that HUD mandates denial for. And it's actually a lot more limited than we might expect. So for example, HUD says that you have to deny someone if an applicant has been evicted from federally assisted housing for a drug related criminal activity in the past three years. A lot of people interpret that as any eviction or any drug related criminal activity or any time period, but it's actually a lot more specific than that, right? It's only eviction from a property for drug related criminal activity, right? Another one is um, if there's reasonable call to believe, cause to believe that a household member's illegal use or pattern of illegal use of a drug may interfere with the health, safety, or right to peaceful enjoyment of the premises. Again, these parameters are not really defined. It's kind of confusing. So a lot of this is often interpreted as, well, let's make it broader. When in reality, you can still be following the, the laws that HUD is setting out by making things really specific. And so really the only thing that you have to do is abide by these exact standards and not go any further than that. And so there's more of kind of details about this in that um, document I linked to, the frequently asked questions. And so I encourage you to take a look at it if you have questions about that. There's also been a new rule proposed by HUD um, that actually clarifies some of this stuff. So, um, and I have a bit about that at the end, but it looks like we're running out of time. So let me just address one other question that often comes up on this and then I'll pause and just see what questions you all have. So we're often um, asked, actually probably the most common question we are asked when we talk about background screening is this question about fair housing. So a lot of people are concerned, you know, property managers are trained to treat everyone exactly the same right? Have really objective criteria. I said that earlier, right? Have really objective and clear criteria, treat everyone equally. And so there's this concern if we're encouraging people to look at, to do an individualized assessment of each person, look at mitigating factors, make decisions based on that, that they're opening themselves up to fair housing complaints because of alleged discrimination. And so I want to, um, and I totally understand that fear, like introducing discretion, means that you could also inject fear and bias and prejudice in there, right? So I want to encourage you to think about the ways that you can introduce this nuance and this looking at the whole person 
without violating fair housing. And HUD has actually encouraged folks to do this. So there's been, again, again a lot of guidance from HUD on encouraging to do an individualized assessment, encouraging you to look at more pieces than just what's listed on a screening report because HUD recognizes that just screening, using a screening report can be discriminatory. There's a lot of discussion about finding a less discriminatory alternative to traditional background screening and using an individualized assessment is in fact one of those less discriminatory alternatives. And I mentioned that HUD recently put out a new rule, proposed rule about this. And so just a quick bit about that is that this new proposed rule that is currently seeking comment tries to clarify a lot of the specifics of what HUD asks for in background screening and clarify and specify um, how properties should use that guidance. They also are mandating now, instead of encouraging, they're wanting to mandate an individualized assessment. So that fear of does this individualized assessment violate fair housing doesn't need to be a fear anymore because HUD is, is, is in fact pushing that model. I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna pause there. I just kind of threw a lot of information at you. Um, I'll follow up with a lot of those resources in case you wanna look at them, but let me pause there. Questions, thoughts, comments on any of this stuff or things we didn't get to? I realize an hour is not a lot of time and I talked a lot. So what else did you wanna know that we didn't talk about? It's no problem too. I'm happy to stay on if anyone wants to stay and ask questions. This is a really amazing, this is a lot of amazing information. Thank you so much. Yeah. I get, I'm, just, I'm just struck by how much, it seems like this is a world where we're like, well, I think this is, this is how it has to be. And there's actually, it's not, <laughs> right? Like when you actually look at it, it's like, no, like the, that's not the law. That's not this thing. That's not this thing. Even like on the, well, HUD assisted housing can't do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Uh, there's just, I think I'm struck by how much I think prop, like the housing world lives in assumptions of this is how things have always been done or have to be done. And yeah. I really appreciate you sharing the info. Yeah, I feel like doing this work, I'm really grateful because I've gotten to learn a lot about that and realize just how much mm -hmm. I also have been operating under a lot of assumptions of like, well, this is just how it's done. When like, if we take a step back and challenge ourselves to examine why we're assuming that, like realize that it's not actually, not actually true. And there's a lot more room for creativity um, and open-mindedness in this world. I'm happy to share this, um, these slides too, um, with you, Joanna, and, and the links. That would be great. That would be great. I, uh, I copied the links from the chat and I'd love to send these slides with a, a link to the recording. And also this has got me thinking too, like maybe this is too small of a group for this information and we should do a bigger training maybe at our October conference. So I'll be sure and um, be in touch with Brooke about that. Yeah. Uh, and, or, you know, maybe not at our conference, but maybe at something else too, because it sounds like uh, a lot of people could maybe be interested in this information who weren't here today. And, and we only had an hour, maybe we could really dig in if we had it longer in person workshop or something. So thank you so much. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. I'm going to put my today. email in the chat too. If folks have other questions that pop up um, and, and Joanna, you know how to get in touch with Brooke and me. So yes, to help anytime. Any but final so questions? So great. Well, um, next month we're going to be in person in Reno. And so I'd love if you guys could register using that link that I sent out in the email, because um, otherwise I don't know um, how big of a space to get or how much food to order. And also I will be paying a special guest to come in and do the training. So I don't really want to pay someone to come in if we're only going to have two or three people because her the exercise that she's doing won't work with, with fewer than maybe 10 people. So please register as soon as you're able to commit. Um, as always, reach out to me. Sherry put her email uh, generously in the chat. So it sounds like if you have follow-up questions later, uh, you're able to reach out and ask for more resources. But otherwise, thank you so much. I'm so excited. This has really got my brain going. So I'm really, I'm very energized by this conversation today.